Hey everyone, Ponyo here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of After Dinner Mints. Before we begin, I highly encourage everyone watching to join us in the Artblocks Discord. For those watching us on the live stream, there will be people in the community chatting in the Artblocks Mints channel. A link to our Discord can be found in the description of this video. As always, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode of our weekly show. And now I want to introduce our guest for this evening. We have Artblox founder and generative artist, Snowfro. Hey everybody, good evening. We have generative artist, Josh Bagley. Hello. And then we have Artblox collector, Proper. Hey everybody, Proper here, AKA the uh, Discord resident goalkeeper, AKA <laughs> Brian, so. <laughs> Thanks, Proper. Um, well, Josh, I want to kick it off with you. Thank you so much uh, for joining this evening. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for joining us on After Dinner Mints. Uh, I want to kick it off by just asking you, can you tell us a little bit about your background when it comes to art? Sure. So um, I've been doing art for about two years now um, and code art for a year and a half. Uh, so I actually went to school for engineering and, uh, you know, Towards, towards the end of it, I, I started to get a little bit interested in art, uh, experimenting with some physical mediums, trying them out, like I did some stone carving, uh, I sketched some graffiti on paper, and um, none of them really stuck. It wasn't until I started learning Python for my old job um, where I realized how much I enjoyed coding and, uh, and started playing with uh, creating some visuals through there. I think it was also starting to get interested in uh, some computer sims like uh, Ficerum, which is like a slime mold simulation and Conway's Game of Life, that sort of thing. And I realized, okay, that stuff's made with code. I'm learning how to code and uh, just kind of tried it out from there and got really sucked into it. Um, eventually I figured out about generative art and what that was and I learned about processing and kind of dove into it. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I kind of got hooked. I think it was, that tie between like, you know, coding is a little bit engineering and, and a lot of problem solving, which is what I really enjoyed about engineering. So it was kind of that perfect, perfect fit. Excellent. And then was there a, a family member or maybe a, like a specific artist that kind of spoke to you and got you excited about art like early on? Yeah. So funny enough, like as I was going through this period of trying to find some kind of art medium, uh, I met my girlfriend, Nicole, and she went to school for art. She's a painter. Um, so I think, you know, I was already kind of inspired to find some kind of art and she was really into it and she actually like helped a lot, uh, like kind of showing me the different avenues of art and, and the importance of it and, and the, the beauty of it. And yeah, it was, she's definitely been like super inspiring and, and helped me out a lot throughout this whole process. So that was nice. Yeah. Very cool. Would, would there ever be like a possible collaboration maybe down the road or is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've talked about that, especially I've been doing, you know, I sometimes do pen plots and uh, I was thinking about like kind of incorporating her paintings with pen plots. I'm actually also thinking about um, tokenizing some of her paintings as well. Oh, but nice. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, you'll definitely have to drop something inside of your uh, your artist channel if anything happens oh, yeah. with that. Awesome. And then what was your introduction into the NFT and crypto space? Um. So... You know, back in November when when it was all blowing up, like I had some people message me about it. Um, and I think, you know, that was around the time when I was doing a lot of pen plotting and I was starting to sell some pen plots and that kind of got me interested in this idea of, of maybe doing it a little bit more full time. Um, I was enjoying art at the time way more than I was enjoying my job. And I saw NFTs as like this kind of opportunity, like, okay, I can maybe sell some digital stuff too on the side. And uh, so I... I started selling a little bit. I did some stuff through, I think I did one work through Rarible and then a couple through Foundation initially and had a little bit of success. Um, it was a little little like mix of excitement and disappointment, you know, uh, but obviously that kind of changed when I found out about Art Blocks, of course. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. yeah. How did you learn about Art Blocks? And then, you know, what ended up, you know, was there something specific that helped you decide to launch a project on Art Blocks? Yeah, I mean, like I, I saw, I think, you know, the first time I heard about it, I saw Dimitri's Ringers. Um, I, I think then, though, I didn't really understand 
too much of what was going on. I kind of, you know, I knew he was releasing a whole bunch of works and um, and selling them together. But I think it was it was actually Aaron Penne's apparitions that uh, when I saw him do that and I saw that whole project, you know, like this 1500 mints and um, you know all selling out pretty quickly. I just thought that was absolutely amazing and uh, that was like okay, I should you know pay pay more attention to this and figure out what's going on and check it out and um, yeah. So that that was probably when I really learned about it and took it seriously and checked it out. Very cool. And then uh, I think you have some, do you, can you show us, share us some of your early generative art pieces that you've created? Sure. Let me pull it up real sec. Oh, I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> this, I just got this webcam and sometimes it resets the zoom, which is fine. There you go. Okay. Um, yeah, I've got it up now. Okay. Okay. So this is, uh, this was probably the first time I had a project that I wrote that was actually generative, um, where like I could keep rerunning it, rerunning it, and getting these new outputs. Um, it's pretty simple. It's just some points on the screen distorted with Perlin noise. Um, but I really love the way it kind of looked like these sort of infrared images of ocean life on some animal yeah, planet. like some so jellyfish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I had like, you know, these guys going along with the, I don't know if you could, how well you could see this text over here, but it's got like, you know, the date, location, depth, those are all generative. And cool. Yeah. So I spent some time with that. I, I had some fun with it. And are those pieces that are, that you've already sold some on like on a separate platform outside of our box? No, I haven't sold any of these. These just okay. live on Instagram right now. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's it's definitely a project I might visit again some some other time though. Uh, but for now, it's just one of those like, you know, experiments with Pearl and Noise and and seeing how far I could take that. And yeah, very cool. And then kind of to kind of show the progression of your art on the blockchain, can you share with us your first ever NFT that you minted? Yeah. So funny enough, I can't find it on Rarible, but I have a video of it here. Okay. Um, this is differential growth. So this was, I minted this on variable um, and differential growth is another one of those programs that um, I've been working on for a while and I'm still working on now, just like continuously playing with it. Um, so this was the first one. It's just a little 30 second animation. Uh, I think it sold for like 0.3 Ethereum or something like that. But uh, yeah, it's kind of fun. That's very cool. I love it. Yeah. All right, so. I also, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no. Go, no I'd love you to. Well, no, your, then I, I just. I, yeah, I continued on with it on uh, on Foundation. And I think this was like, I sold this for one Ethereum, and that was like the biggest, you know, that was a huge moment for me. I kind of just was in disbelief of that whole thing. Um, yeah, so. That's awesome. But that's it. <laughs> no, that's exciting. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, once you have like a couple of these sales kind of in your back pocket, then you're like, all right, well, what else can I do and kind of help push right. the push you to like create even more so i think that's yeah definitely. it's always cool to kind of see these early pieces from artists yeah well so your first project on art blocks curated project is called dreams can you tell us a little bit about the the idea behind the project dreams sure so um dreams it was interesting because dreams was never really meant to be or it wasn't a project that i that i had initially set out to to create it was something that i discovered more um, I was actually working on a completely different project for Artblocks with differential growth. Um, and then while I was waiting for my application to be processed, I was playing around with uh, rectangular subdivision, which is just like this kind of well-known um, technique of taking a rectangle and cutting it up into smaller squares. Um, and so I hadn't played with that before. I kind of taught myself how to do it. And then I was messing around with it, um, you know, experimenting with all the little, little parts of it, seeing what I could do if like I changed this part or, and then at some point I made some change, I hit refresh and I had this like really interesting pattern on the screen and I kept hitting refresh and it was like, oh, look at that one. That one's like way different and kept getting surprised basically by it. So, you know, initially it was one of those things I didn't set out to create, but once I created it, it was like, yeah, this is sick. I got to run with this. Um, and then from there, the idea was, you know, let's push this variation as far as I can. Let's. I wanted to create like a like a, a feeling of like a lot of movement in the static image with like fun colors and you know you had all these crooked lines and stuff combining with those so um, yeah it was like it, it was it was a project of discovery really I guess. Mm -hmm. 
That's awesome. And this might have, you might have answered this question a little bit, but, you know, how do you go about creating a project? You know, do you have the vision of what the final product will look like at first? Or do you kind of start from scratch and, you know, kind of help build and build like over time? Well, so with this project, it was the, you know, the kind of I stumbled into it. But uh, Humanopolis was the other way around where I, you know, I knew what I wanted right from the beginning and kind of worked my way towards that. So I think like I have two ways of making art. The first one is through usually like I'll pick something new to learn, learn how to do it right, and then start kind of breaking it and seeing what happens and doing a lot of experimentation. So that was dreams. And then, like I said, the Cumanopolis, I was like, okay, I want cities. So how can I do that? And then just working towards that slowly. Very cool. And then I always find it interesting. I mean, I'm not a coder myself, but how was it using the random hash you know, created at the moment of transaction for the first time. Was that really strange to kind of like utilize that, you know, when you're, you're building all these mints or is it, did it kind of feel natural? Yeah. I mean, it was, well, I mean, using the, using the hash to create the, the outputs, I think before I was using just random numbers for seeds to, to seed the, the program um, and create the variation. But uh, yeah, I think the hash, I think it, the scary part was during the actual minting, like just not having that control over it and just kind of letting it go. And, and uh, it was exciting, but also terrifying. You really have to, I think it, it was just like letting, letting the, the algorithm take over more than I was used to doing, you know, and just letting it, you know, I don't get to choose what the mints are these people do when they buy it and it's going to be random and having that trust in your algorithm. But uh, yeah, I think it was, it was scary, but also a lot of fun. Yeah. Cool. And then uh, for people that weren't in Marfa, the exhibit guide uh, that was used for exhibit zero, which is called Genesis, Mint Zero from Dreams was actually used for the cover of that that catalog. So I just yeah. want to say, I, when I first saw it, I was like, yeah, this is like the perfect. I, I couldn't think of any like any other mint from you know that series three that would have been like best used for that cover. So congratulations! Hell I thought yeah. I thought it looked really really cool, and I was oh, thank you. No, that. I was. I was blown away <laughs> when I walked up to the house. I grabbed the pamphlet. I was like, "Holy shit, that's dreams!" <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it was. I, yeah, I think it fit well. I think it was a, the pattern, you know, kind of kind of fit as a cover. But I was super, super excited to see that. Definitely. Uh, can you share, you know, some of your favorite mints from from the Dreams project, and then talk sure. a little bit about, you know, why they're specifically your some of your favorites? Yeah, definitely. Um. I'm just waiting for the screen to pop up. There we go. Uh, so this one, this is uh, number 388. I think when I was initially going through the the mints, this is the one that stood out. Um, I don't know why. I just I was really drawn to. It. I think it's just you know you have these big blocks of color um, combined with the with the stripes. It just had a, some nice balance to it. I also really love pink and blue. It's like my favorite color combination. So. Um, yeah, for that reason, I, I love this one. It's actually, I got my, the first print I did, like as a proof, was of this one. Uh, it looks great on the wall. I have it in the in the living room. Nice. I also have this one. This is number 629. Um, it's just like a really powerful one. It's got a lot of movement and the strong colors to go along with it. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Just the, it's, it's very dramatic, I guess. Yeah, I, I think yeah. the blues especially help it just give it like that added pop, you know, and yeah. I think it's a, yeah, it's a beautiful mint. Yeah. Classic primary colors with the, with the, you know, really like dramatic straight line through the middle and everything coming off of it. I thought that was, uh, that was fun. And then I have, uh, this is number 680, which oh, I call wow. Nightlight. Yeah. Yeah. I like this one, like, especially compared to the last one, it's very calm. And then you just have this little nightlight in the center and then maybe your, your clock light or something on the side. I think, just, you know, this one really fits dreams for the title and how it, what it reminds me of. And yeah, I really like it for that. That's cool. And it, um, was that more of, was that like kind of like a, an intentional thing where, you know, some of the mints could look like that? Or is that, uh, you know, maybe like a bug or like an error that kind of just like happened to, to show up? Um, I don't know about this one specifically. There, I think this one was pretty standard for what could happen. I think it's more rare because... You know, usually you have more concentrated areas of, of colors like this, not just two select few areas. There were um, a couple of mints that 
had this really random, like it was all one pattern. I'm just trying to see if I could find it. I thought I saved it over here, maybe not. Um, you know, just like these these little spots where like the whole screen is stripes and then it just has these little blocks in there that are, actually this one is, this one kind of works. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if this was a bug or not, but I don't remember really seeing too much of these when I was uh, working on developing the project. So yeah. Just like where the, the the whole thing's one pattern, and then you just have this one spot where there's yeah. a couple of colored blocks. So would you say that some of those mints were, you know, surprising to you? I guess you know when the once you started going through all the different mints after it minted. Yeah, definitely. Out. Yeah, I have a, I have a few surprise mints. There's there's two in particular that really caught me off guard. Uh, the first one is the arrow, which I think a lot of people oh, wow. have seen, number twenty eight, well, where it's just one. an arrow. <laughs> you know, like it's completely <laughs> random that it ended up like that, but it did. So I think that's pretty, that's pretty wild. Um, and that's just based off of, you know, whatever noise field I was using that ended up having this kind of shape and it came through in the pattern. And so that was neat. And then there's also uh, number 268. I don't know what it is about this one, but I never saw anything like it when I was developing. And I don't think there's any other dreams that, are, that have this kind of style. Um, yeah, it's just, it's it's still kind of an enigma to me. I don't really know what exactly caused it to look this way. Yeah, that so. one, that one's super cool. It kind of reminds me of like an abstract building or yeah, yeah. And that, I feel like that almost kind of leads into EQ Monopolis, which we'll talk about in a second. But I want to talk a little bit about the palettes. So you know, sure. choosing a palette and also naming a color palette always seem to be fun when creating a project. You know, how do you go about selecting both, and is there any meaning behind you know some of the naming? or some of the names you have for the color palettes? Yeah, so, um, you know, a lot of times I like to look at, uh, like, old images for color inspirations, like, specifically, uh, I think old sci-fi art has a lot of fun colors, um, and, like, retro movie posters. So some of my palettes will be inspired by those. Um, and then some of them are pulled directly from pictures I take. So, for example, I think the most obvious one's Kyra. Um, Kyra is my leopard gecko. You can see her tank back there. I think she's hiding right now, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, I have a, a picture of her I could share, but let's see. Yeah. So this is, this Aww. is Kyra leopard gecko. So I pulled the colors for that palette from this image. So you have like some of the blues and the yellows and the pinks. I amplified them a little bit to make them a little bit more vibrant. Um, but then of course, like I named the palette Kyra cause it came from Kyra. Mm -hmm. So. And then other ones are going to be more, uh, just m more based off of like the emotion that it evokes or the, the feeling you get from it. Or uh, actually, I think propaganda came from old World War II propaganda photos. Oh, so, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So very cool. Yeah. And then, so you mentioned movie posters, right? You know, as far as yeah. the color palettes, are were there specific movies? that you know kind of inspire that or is it just like movie posters you're kind of just flipping through and then you kind of just pulled some of those colors yeah none of the, most of them were movies i'd never heard of honestly okay. i kind of just like did some google searches for like you know old old movie posters for like horror flicks and um you know these really like cheesy because they did a lot of cool sometimes like these cool uh cool drawings on, on the posters that like i remember this one uh I don't know if it's called like the mantis or something, but it just has this giant praying mantis and all these people <laughs> around it. And yeah, I thought that was a cool one. Uh, but yeah. Very cool. All right. So I want to talk about Ecumenopolis. Am I saying that correctly, by the way? Yeah. yeah. Ecumenopolis. Okay. Yep. All right. Awesome. Um, so <laughs> the name is Greek, meaning a world city. How did you, mm -hmm. so obviously the, we can talk a little bit about, you know, what these mints look like, but how did you come up with the name itself? Is there, do you have any, um, connection with with Greece or, or no what? no connection with Greece I think I I, uh, I like obviously the the project is generative cityscapes but I wanted it to be more focused on uh, like you know you're discovering alien worlds not just cities so you know and and this whole idea of like a, a world a planet-wide city I think it was I think that term was used in like either Star Wars or Star Trek at some point um, and, and I think that's where, when I found the word, that's where I saw it referenced to. But uh, yeah, it just, it just, it fit that, that style I was going for, that idea I was going for, of just like a full, a full world that you discovered that's just this huge, uh, endless city. 
Got it. Cool. And then, uh, so it looks like, for me at least, there's some inspiration on this project that came from dreams, you know, as far as, like, the palettes. Like, even looking at this mint that you have up right now, it kind of looks like, you know, a building that's in a city. And then it's almost, it was almost like a natural progression from one project to the other. Is that, is that correct? Or, like, how did you kind of go from that curated project to this playground project? Yeah, so they're very, very much so connected. I mean, I when I was making Dreams, there were some uh, some mints that that just looked like buildings to me, and I think that's what initially inspired that idea of like uh, of creating like um, a, a cityscape. So you know, as soon as I finished Dreams, that was like on my list. Like next thing I want to do, I want to make a cityscape. Um, and so, but so not only is it like inspired by Dreams, but it also has a lot of uh, the techniques from dreams in it. So um, the patterns on the buildings and also um, some of the mints where you can see the ground, you'll actually see similar patterns on there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it uses a lot of that technique that I learned when I made dreams uh, in the in that project itself. So very definitely like it, like if I was just making works to share on Instagram, that that would definitely come naturally you know I'd make dreams and then that would spark another thing and I would go on and, and make that and keep going from there so awesome yeah. I love that uh, do you have any early prototypes of what the project looked like at a at an early stage I do yeah let's see it's uh it's quite different from what it looks like now but and I did share I shared these on Instagram but this is like the first the first ever uh version of it it was very like just kind of a making sure I could actually do it, you know, getting the technique down, and um, but you could see that oh, wow, kind of, yeah. it's got the curves and um, let's see, so this one just kind of focusing on the stacking ability of the shapes and um, but yeah, no, so I was I was working through it, kind of cleaning things up. The biggest thing was, you know, getting the outlines around the buildings right. Mm -hmm. um, that was like the biggest struggle because you know sometimes the buildings are going to go this way and sometimes they're going to go that way and you're going to see the left side or the right side and you have to know when to, um, you know, draw on that line. So you can see like here, obviously that's, that's not lining up right. And, but, um, you know, at one point I think when I rendered this one, uh, I was like, okay, this is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> like I loved this one. And then I was like, yeah, I gotta, I'm, now I'm excited about this. And, um, well, now that yeah. you showed a couple of those images, it, it I'm curious to know about the shading, you know, on the side, like it looks like the east side of the buildings from just that image right there, it kind of shows a little bit of shading. Is that, like how challenging is that from a non-coder's perspective that this looks like it's really hard to tell an object to be like, cool, I want you shaded on the right side. Like how, I guess, how do you go about doing that? Maybe without well, going through all the jargon. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, let's see if I have, like this picture here might, showed a little bit clear, but like the building is just made up of different squares. This this is actually like there's a square there, there's a square there, there's a square there. And then I also drew a shape like this, which is just, you know, it takes these two points of the square and then extends the lines a little bit. So it's just made up of different uh different four-sided shapes. And then so the ones on the side I will uh color darker than the ones in the front, which is basically just taking the colors that I'm already using and then um just decreasing their brightness a little bit or increasing them for the top, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, it, I think it's cool to see it uh, in this kind of state too, where you could see this was just part of like the optimizing that I was doing where um, I had to render shapes outside of the view, but I didn't need to, you know, display what was going on in the inside over here because mm -hmm. it just took up so much time. But you can see like here just the frame of, of the shape and then I'm adding in these uh, like little patches of of patterns to fill in the the shapes. Got it. Is that actually one of the mints that were from that project, or is that no? Is but that interestingly tech? enough, so this is this is the mint would look like like zoomed in, um, but you know, all of these images have the code attached to them. So if you're if you're savvy enough, you can go in and you can actually change the scale, and you you should be able to see this uh, on the outside of it because it does. I like I have to. Uh, let me see, I have a, a better photo here. So, like, you can see there's a bunch of, uh, all the buildings are kind of curving one way. So if I don't render the ones outside of the frame, mm -hmm. you'll just have this big empty space there. So 
um, there's a lot going on outside of the of the image that you can't see unless you zoom out. Interesting. Cool. Yeah. That's very cool. Uh, were there any bu- kind of going back to how you, I asked you in dreams where I, we're talking about bugs? Were there any bugs in this project that you discovered early on, and maybe you decided to kind of leave in, or maybe like once you see, saw everything kind of minted out, that you were really surprised by you know some of the mints coming through? Um, I don't know if there was necessarily bugs. There were kind of unintentional things that. Uh, um, uh, like one of the styles that I, you know, or one of the traits, the the buildings shrink as they go up, and um, you know, if they shrink too much, they just become this little stick. And at first, I wasn't sure if I kind of wanted that style, but I ended up really liking it, so I kept it in. So you get these kind of. This is one of them. This is a uh, number one sixty one, where like all of the buildings are just these really really thin noodle toothpick yeah. things, you know. So those are kind of interesting. Um, and then other ones that. Like this one, I think is just kind of wild. It just is kind of pushing the algorithm to the max. You know, it's every space on the screen has a building, and they're all really big. Um, I think this one actually takes the longest to render too out of all of them. Wow. So, yeah, not necessarily yeah. any bugs, but but things that were kind of unexpected. Got it. And then, can you share with us if you have any others up as far as uh, some of your favorite mints from Ecumenopolis? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I love this one. Uh, this one gives me like super. I feel like it, you would see this like in a Star Wars movie. It's yeah, kind of silly, like know, futuristic, everything. like robot. robot yeah, like well, yeah, they almost <laughs> look like robots instead of buildings. I think those honestly for me were the were the most interesting were the mints that didn't necessarily look like buildings, more like I don't know. I guess this one either looks like hairs or like factories or something. Yeah, it's like a um, razor commercial or something where like a razor will kind of come across and just like knock out some <laughs> yeah i know exactly it looks like one of those like microscopic images <laughs> yeah like, exactly like a flea or something um it. this one looks like it's underwater too which i really liked it's almost like it's yeah, a, cool. a kelp forest or something and then there's one more too that i really like uh this is 177 and the reason i like it is because well the atmosphere effect on it is really really strong so it looks super sunny but then also um you have these shaded blocks on the bottom, which are just mm-hmm. part of the ground, but they look like shadows just because they're like that darker shade of blue compared compared to the rest of it. I thought that was kind of neat. Very cool. That's awesome. And then yeah. I, I got to Oh, you have a couple more. I, I mean, I have I have a bunch more, but we don't we have to. Go yeah, no, I'd like to see a couple more. Yeah, definitely. Let's sure. Cruise through a couple more. Um, yeah, this is one ninety four. Uh, this one stood out to me because you just have like this, you know. It's almost like they're all these other buildings are spectating these these two spectators yeah. or these two other buildings in a ring or something. I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, and this one is 429. I just thought it was kind of a almost like a terrifying one. You know, it's just got this like eerie vibe to it. So yeah, that's it. That's all I'll share for now. Cool. No, I love it. I, I got a community question uh, earlier this week. Do you plan on selling prints for for uh, Ecumenopolis? Yeah, something? no, I'm a, I'm I'm selling prints. I, I've sold a bunch okay. actually. Uh, yeah, if you go to my channel and check the pins, uh, I have some info about prints, or you could just send me a message on Discord and I'll I'll get back to you. Got it. Okay. And then uh, are they still available also for for dreams as well, or just you can yes. Okay. Yeah, my my plan is to as long as I have access to a printer, I'll be selling them. So there's no there's no deadline or anything. And I know every artist is a little bit different as far as printing is concerned. So I, I'm not sure what setup you have. Are you doing it where you obviously have to own the NFT and then you're only printing it once? Or is it if it trades hands and you'll make you know additional prints? Yeah, it's it's only once per NFT. So I have a list going of, of the ones that have been printed. Um, so if you sell it, you know, it's kind of up to you to either, you know, keep the keep the print or or if the seller if the buyer wants it, you know whatever but try to work out um, a deal yeah okay and then uh, i'm curious to know uh, do you have any info on maybe a potential future art box project you know will and i'm curious will you kind of play off of you know i feel like you know you said for dreams you were inspired to make uh or ecumenopolis you were inspired by dreams yeah. for the future pro- next project you know if you have any like testaments or if you can talk a little bit about it is that going to be inspired by those first two, two, two projects as well? Um, so I do have some stuff in the works. Um, one that I am trying to see how far I can take it. 
Um, but nothing related necessarily to these these projects yet. Although it's not something that I have uh, like that I'm not thinking about. There's definitely I have a couple of ideas of ways to expand Acumenopolis, just not quite there yet. Um, but I am working on, and I have shared this a little bit before, um, but I'm playing with this sort of a uh, light refraction blending algorithm. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so this is this started with um, playing with with light rays and and learning about uh, refraction, so like how light changes when it passes through an object. Mm -hmm. um, it actually started, I think this was like the one of the first ones, where it's these just these shapes. You have the light coming from here and then kind of refracting through, changing color and um, but yeah. I, I don't. I'm not it's entirely beautiful. sure. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how how far these will go, but specifically like these ones where they're more abstract and kind of fill the screen, I'm I'm really excited about. It. Especially the the details when you zoom in, you can see. I, I'm sure the compression is killing it, but you know, <laughs> I can share it in the in the chat. But you have like all these little circles that are uh, combining together, and you get these really nice textures. And so it's it's very different from what I have been doing with like solid fill. Mm -hmm. where I want to focus more now on on these textures and gradients and that kind of thing. So pretty excited about this one. Yeah, well, we we'll definitely look forward to, you know, seeing more previews of, of your next, you know, Playground project whenever that's being released. Uh, so yeah. a couple other questions. One of, Another one from uh, the community was, they, they asked, I see generative art becoming very mainstream. What are your thoughts, you know, as far as like NFTs, how that's going to play kind of a, a role in generative art in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it makes sense as becoming mainstream, right? Like there's there's a lot of attention on it and a lot of money behind it. And like kind of same as any other art form, it just gets popular. And I, I don't think it's a bad thing though. You know, I think it's gonna, you know, with especially with like new technology that comes out, it's only gonna get more interesting and there's a lot to be discovered. Like for me at least, you know, generative art is this just endless pit of, of possibilities so it's really cool to see like what other people do and and um, all the possibilities with it and especially with with crypto art too i think like I, I can't remember who had mentioned it but someone was talking about um like instead of sharing your work on instagram and just leaving it on there like you just mint everything and you know just to keep it more permanently and 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 i think that's really really awesome so yeah, I think it's. I think there's a bright future ahead for it. You know, and it's already really cool, and it's cool to see where it's going. Awesome. What are your thoughts on in-person minting opportunities? You know, there's already been a couple art blocks artists that have done some in-person uh, things at uh, I'm Not Art in Chicago, as well as Bright Moments. Uh, I think they're actually now in New York. Uh, but yeah, is that something that you would con like possibly explore as an artist to do something in person and have some kind of more immersive experience or or yeah what are your thoughts on all that yeah i i would love to do that i have no idea what yet but i would love to do that at some point i mean like i'm like like i said at the beginning i'm only doing this for like a year and a half i don't have any plans in stopping you know i mm -hmm. absolutely love it so there's a lot of possibilities for the future i think in-person minting is definitely something on my list of of things i'd like to explore so cool and then do you have any other artwork available i know i think you kind of mentioned it earlier on but if you don't mind bringing it up again, as far as like other work, artwork, other artwork available on platforms outside of our blocks. Yeah, I think so. Foundation is where I, I list my like one of ones. Um, I haven't listed uh, anything as of as of late. Nothing's for sale. But uh, yeah, that's that's where I'll I'll sell outside of our blocks. I also have a, a an HEN account, but I haven't posted on there in a while. But yeah. Okay, and then. Uh, as someone who's interested in generative art and I don't have any coding experience, I know there's a lot of other people in the community that are interested in potentially learning how to code as well. You know, what is one resource, whether it's a book, website, video, that you would recommend to an aspiring generative artist? Um, so like everyone else has said, like the coding train is just the, the best thing ever. And that's where I've learned so much of my stuff from. Um, definitely would recommend that. So it's Dan Schiffman's The Coding Train on YouTube. Um, also, just the the processing and P5 websites have have like a, a references and, and resources and examples to learn from. Um, I think, too, besides uh, like tutorials and that kind of thing, you know, once you have 
a little bit of a foundation. I think the best way to learn is to pick a project you want to do and just dive into it. And um, I think, like personally, like that's how I learn things. The best is just by doing them. And, yeah. Excellent. And then, how can people reach you? Should they have any questions or, yeah, maybe just reach out to you for for whatever reason? Yeah, just message me on Discord. That's the best way. Um, if it's Twitter, I'll try to. Sometimes I, I forget to check the the requests on there, so I think Discord's the best the best way to do that. Excellent. Well, Josh, thank you so much for joining us this evening on After Dinner Mints. Really appreciate your time and talking to the community and myself about uh, generative art. Hell yeah! No, it's been great. Thank you so much for having me. I've cool. Had a thank good time. <laughs> great. Yeah. Well, proper, you're up next. How are you doing? Hey, everybody. How's doing it going? Well. Cool. Doing pretty well. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I've been wanting to have you on the show for a while, and then for whatever reason, kind of just fell off, but I'm really happy that you're on tonight. Uh, I, yeah, I want to go ahead and get started. How, how did you get into NFTs, crypto, and then you know eventually learn about our blocks? Yeah, so I don't actually know if I should be embarrassed telling this story, but um, about how I got into <laughs> crypto. So... I've uh, been in the crypto space for about eight years now, uh, for, so late 2013. I was a uh, junior in high school at the time. And one day, I think it was The Verge, they put out an article about this guy um, who would la- I would later find out to be Jackson Palmer. Is He's creating this cryptocurrency called like Dogecoin. It's about the meme and everything. <laughs> and, you know, me being the young, dumb, like dumb, impressionable, high schooler that I was, um, I thought that was awesome. And then, you know, at, at that time, you know, uh, I, I kind of took it at face value, but then, you know, not so long after I kind of started actually digging into it because I was like, Oh, Dogecoin, like Doge, I know that meme. And then I was like, wait, well, it's a cryptocurrency. And next thing I know, which is actually my earliest crypto memory is I was touring colleges and after we had gotten back from a day of touring colleges I had like I was mining Dogecoin on my laptop (laughs) and and so I mean yeah from there um, I got acclimated to the crypto space really quickly bought my first Bitcoin for $800 and over the next few months or years or whatever it was proceeded to watch it go you know go to a low of $180 and so, you know, not the, at the time I was like, oh, dang, like that sucks. But at the, at the same time, like for whatever reason, you know, my dad, my parents, my friends in school were telling me, you know, sell it, you know, cut your losses. But for whatever reason, I was like, eh, whatever. And, you know, now, now I seem like a genius, even though it was just like <laughs> dumb luck and it very, really was dumb luck. Um, but I, I didn't come from like a trading background before that and everything. Like I was 16. I you know, was off doing stuff with friends and whatnot. Uh, so I did this thing that everybody does to spot a little bit of all the top crypto coins at the time, like pure coin and whatever. Um, and so shortly thereafter that, while I was trading, started helping out with some projects. So like 2014 or 2015, I was working with a one of those kind of early decentralized cloud projects. Um, and then I, I kind of took a break, I want to say, for like a year or kind of like a year and a half from that and focus purely on trading. Um, not going to say I was an amazing trader. I, I, I did decent, I guess. But after that, kind of a shoe in someone I met at the previous project asked me to join a uh, company that was in the crypto trading space and like the infrastructure space. Uh, spent three years there, uh, learned, frankly, a lot as far as, you know, the, kind of the inner workings of just, you know, things like people saying oh the institutions are coming and but then when you're actually like in that space you realize oh the institutions have been here for a long time and you know they're you it may not be apparent and you know obviously nowadays you see new ones you know entering the space every day but you know there are a lot of huge firms that have been out there for a long time but um yeah fast forward from that i left that company in 2019 fast forward um i I, as far as finding out about nfts like i wasn't early or anything like i heard about crypto kitties way back when didn't think didn't give it like a second thought after that and obviously at the beginning of this year when things really started to pick back up um you know just being in the crypto space i would have to have lived under a rock if i didn't hear about 
stuff at the beginning of the year. <laughs> so I kind of dove back in. And um, I think I, I, I made the mistake that I think a lot of people make it in that I kind of came in with the trading mindset just because I'd been trading for all these years um, in the crypto space. And so I, I, you know, I tried to do the whole flipping thing and whatever, and it didn't go well, didn't go poorly. It, it just is, it, you know, it was what it was. And, um, but, you know, a little bit after that, I found art blocks. I found some other generative um, art projects and it didn't click immediately. It was more so that, um, you know, to me at the time, before before I'd really transitioned from that trading mindset to, you know, I guess where I am today, it was, oh, this looks cool. I wonder if I can make a quick buck. But I, I don't want this to sound like a show because it's not. So I'll, uh, I'll just, what really made it click was, um, it's this project for emergence by this like anonymous developer. And it was the first time I dealt with gas wars. It was the first time that, you know, I saw like this, you know, everybody in this pure chaos. And it was like, what are you unpausing the contract? And it was like, that happened a hundred times um, every second. Just people asking, when are you going to unpause? When are you going to unpause? And I, I guess having spent all that time trading, I was like, dang, I kind of like this. Like, you know, it gets the blood rushing, gets the adrenaline going. And, um, but from there, so it branched out, we built a community over there and, I think after that clicked and kind of, you know, seeing these after all that chaos and seeing these like beautiful outputs and seeing, you know, a lot of the um, just like watching how the you know market and the sentiment around a project and whatnot evolves um, from before the mint to during the mint to after the mint and kind of in the long term, it, it helped. It helped a lot for things to click for me, and I think for art blocks it clicked even more so just because there's such like depth and variety in the projects that are being offered. And so it's kind of something for everyone in that sense. So, um, yeah, so that, that's kind of, that's kind of how I got to where I am today. And, and I kind of really have shifted away from this mindset. Obviously, you know, I left that, you know, whole trading mindset a long time ago, at least a long time, relatively speaking at <laughs> <laughs> how this face moves, but, um, but yeah, that's kind of my backstory. Um, okay. and, and I will say I, for the most part, uh, I, I think I've got to a point where I'm comfortable with, you know, I don't really need to care about the trading stuff anymore. Like I have a great, and so I have like this great NFT collection. I, and at the end of the day, you know, I know it's hard for a lot of people to like get to that point where you can just say, oh, well, you know, how am I supposed to buy what I like if, um, how am I supposed to buy what I like if, you know, a Fidenza is 150 ETH, I need to get there somehow. And I, I don't know, it, it's, I think that that's something that everybody should strive for. And so I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to trade NFTs or anything. So apologies if that came off that way. But, um, but yeah. No, good. Well, I'm but curious, yeah. I'm curious to know, like, were you aware of generative art prior to Artblocks? Or is this kind of your first introduction into kind of seeing this, this style of art? Um, I, I I think a, I would say that I definitely heard about it. I mean, not in any, um, you know, sense where I realized that there was this, you know, community behind it, you know, the, the people in the process and community have known each other for years type of deal. And, you know, there was this whole space kind of revolving around it that I, you know, just wasn't aware of. So I don't want it to seem like, you know, I've been involved or like knew about it for a long time. Like definitely heard about it, but not in any sense where, um, you know, I was constantly checking in on it or, you know, seeing what was going on in this space and whatnot. And I, I and I feel like that's the case for a lot of people too. Um, at least just from what I've gauged, but yeah, I think that uh, as other people will also echo is that, you know, where we are now, the, the, uh, the crypto kind of, I, I guess it's kind of a match made in heaven for long form generative art. And so it's kind of taking that, you would have someone working on a project um, and, you know, pick the best outputs. And, you know, for a lot of artists, that is the way to go. But also it really puts an algorithm to the test when it's very literally being created at the time that someone purchases it. Purchases it. Um, so that's, and so I think that's kind of like a blessing as well, because now you, now everybody's aware of these amazing artists that kind of didn't really have a way to bring their art to the world before. So 
Definitely. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. Did you have, uh, like, w- what was the first artist or project that really kind of spoke to you and you were like, all right, this is, it, it basically just got you maybe like hooked on, on our blocks where you're like, okay, this is something pretty special. Uh, it's a shame that I had the tech difficulty, so I can't show my screen, but uh, Apparitions 1387, that was the first piece that I ever minted um, on Artblocks. Um, I actually, for a while, I thought Empyrean was the first one I minted, but it turns out that our Apparitions was like three or four or five days before it. Uh, but um, <laughs> yeah, and so uh, that piece, it, I still have the mint. Um, which is also interesting because a lot of the time with the mint, you don't always get the piece that you like a, a ton. But I, I guess, you know, beginner's luck, I got a piece that I really like. And so I, I guess I was lucky in that sense. And that's, at least for art blocks, that's when it's clicked for me as well, like what was going on. And, you know, I, I don't think I could ever bring myself to sell Operation 1387. You know, it's obviously you can say everyone's got a number, but that, you know, and I know that it's not the like aesthetically looking, it's not the most crazy apparition anybody's ever seen, but just like that kind of that backstory for me and where, you know, what it me- meant for me as really shifting from that trading to that collective mindset. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I feel like, I mean, yeah, maybe it's not like aesthetically like the, the most pleasing for, for everyone's first mint, but you know, I think that having your first mint is always just going to be pretty special because then you kind of see how you know what's being created and i don't know i I think that's just something pretty special i think that's cool that you you know you're still hanging on to that mint i think it's it's like a part of your story you know joining the art blocks community no it really is and so people uh people always say you know buy what you like but buying what you like doesn't always necessarily mean it's most aesthetically pleasing i mean there's always that backstory to it and so i could you know there's that backstory this you know whether it be your personal backstory or the you know how the piece ties into a backstory for the artist and all that so i mean there's different levels of liking a piece and for me you know i like the piece aesthetically but i you know like the piece way more just like given that backstory like what have been for me as a collector and like being in this the nft space so definitely and then what, what do you love because i see you all right I see you on Block Talk, you know, pretty, you know, frequently, you know, chiming in all the time, it's a lot of comments, helping people out. You know, what do you love most about the Art Blocks community? That, it, this is a great question. I mean, for the, I would say the number one thing is it's like a very wholesome community. But at the same time, you know, if someone comes in, part of my language, like, you know, shooting the shit, you know, people are going to, you know, not necessarily put them into place because that makes us sound aggressive and it's not. But I, I think that there's a fine balance between, you know, thoughtful discussion um, and, you know, keeping, you know, things um, kind of on the path that w- where we're heading. And, you know, you have a great community of people who are passionate about what we're do- uh, what you guys are doing and what we're doing as a community. And then, yeah, I mean, there really are a lot of things I like about it. I, I this is like one of those questions where like I want to say so much that I don't know what to say. <laughs> and but no, yeah, it's just a very wholesome com- community, like very helpful community. Um, a lot of the people that you know I talk to on a daily or maybe a weekly basis, I met in the Artbox community. And prior to that, you know, going back to the whole trading thing, I was kind of always like off on my own. I never really wanted to, you know, connect with other people. I wanted to like take everything and not really give back. But as far as like the art box community has helped me kind of change that mindset where I get a lot um, from, you know, being involved in the community. And I also like do what I can to give back. And I feel like that's the case for a lot of people as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We appreciate you. I mean, I see you on block talk pretty frequently. And like I said, and I don't know. You're always just helping people out or just creating like fun conversation. I think that's just always nice, you know, nothing too like negative in there. And I feel like everyone's kind of steering the uh, conversation in more of like a positive, positive direction. Um, yeah, exactly. I'm curious, you know, how was your, I think you kind of mentioned a little bit earlier on, but you know, how has your collecting style changed since you first started, you know, when you first minted that apparition? Yeah. So and if LeMay is watching right now, he's going to love this because I've, you know, gone back and forth with him about this. Um, I would say once I kind of really understood, you know, what 
you know, the, kind of the uh, what NFTs were. I, I think I was in that mindset where I wanted to collect just everything. And, you know, for most people and myself included, that, that gets really expensive really quickly. And I was just like, you know, I wanted a piece of every project and I went for the curated set way back when, um, had the curated set. Uh, but but after a while, and I, th I think the shift, the mental shift that happened that really, I guess, helped was when I started collecting one of ones is you're not, you're never thinking about, oh, I can just sell this piece so I can collect this new piece that I like a lot or something. You know, when you're collecting a one of one those are, you know, you're truly buying what you like. You're, you know, you're truly buying, you know, something that's way more illiquid. So it kind of forces you to really think about how you're curating your collection. And, you know, again, I wish I could, um, I didn't have the tech difficulties. And so I could show another, my, probably my, I guess, quote unquote, grail one of one, uh, which was actually created by Josh, uh, differential string an anemone. And, but no, like, that was phenomenal piece. And it was kind of, I, I think towards the beginning, not towards the beginning, but I think kind of around the time that that shift was happening for me, where I was going from, you know, owning all of these pieces and it, it really went from quantity to quality for me. And, you know, Josh's piece was a great example of that. Um, and yeah, it, it's definitely gone from have everything to have what I want. And so, that's kind of the shift that's been happening and it, honestly it feels like it's been a shift that's been happening over years but it's been like six months seven months and yeah here we are <laughs> yeah yeah i know the crypto time is it gets kind of crazy you know um so i got a question for you uh what types of projects are you hoping to see more of in the art blocks in the art block space or just maybe just the nft space as the platform uh grows over time yeah, so that's a great question just because I, I think there's two different types of, I guess, new projects. What kind of two directions that they can tank, at least for me as a collector. It's, it's taking old concepts and kind of reimagining them and, you know, reinterpreting them. Or it's, you know, doing something completely new. And so, I mean... For me personally, I, I think there's a lot of room for the first one. And, you know, I think a lot of AP projects actually do that very well is where they take old, con you know, not old, but, you know, concepts that have been done before and kind of reinvent them or reinterpret them to, and kind of add that flair of the artist or kind of, you know, make use of, you know, something else that, you know, one's really thought of before. But for, I mean, for me, I, I think this space that I am probably more interested in seeing is kind of the, you know, stuff that hasn't been done before. And I think there's still a lot of untapped potential and things like, you know, interactive NFTs, um, which, you know, which AB has a, uh, a fair number of at this point. But um, I think that that's one of those things where I don't really know what's possible just because I haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. And so that I, I think like interactive NFTs are probably the number one thing I would say, like, I can't wait to see what people do with this and, you know, down the road. But, um, but yeah, yeah, probably interactive NFTs. Cool. And then uh, what would be like a piece of advice? It seems like it slowed down a little bit, but, you know, we still have some newer Art Blocks collectors that have joined us. What would be a piece of advice that you would give a new collector on Art Blocks? Um, yeah, so I, I guess it kind of depends on, you know, why they're coming in. So you said collector and... So I, I wouldn't have advice for a flipper just because I wasn't a great flipper of NFTs myself, um, at least starting off, you know, before I made that mental shift and everything. Um, for a collector, I kind of alluded to this before, is, you know, everybody's going to say, buy what you like within reason. Uh, the thing about, you know, the buy what you like part is that doesn't have to be like an aesthetic thing. And so, yeah, it's really easy to look at a piece and say, I like that or I don't like that. But I think it takes time to, you know, legitimately, you know, look at all the angles and, you know, actually appreciate a piece in terms of, yes, there's room for, I love this piece. I love how it looks. There's a lot of room for, 
I love the backstory to this piece and how, you know, the artist kind of took that backstory and portrayed it in the piece or the, you know, in the project. And so I, I think there are a lot of angles that, you know, just because you don't like it, yeah, like a specific piece looking at it, it doesn't mean that you, you know, dislike the piece either. And I think that th there's a lot of things to be said about, you know, just being, you know, not taking a piece at face value. Um, I, I think a great example of that is Enso by Matto. Um, sorry if I mess up either of those names. But um, so at face value, you, you look at it and you say, you know, oh, this project isn't that diverse. Like, what, that's crazy. But then you like you read the best and you're like, no, that makes a ton of sense. Like the entire idea of this project is all about Zen and, you know, enlightenment and whatnot and so when you actually know what he's referencing in the project it makes a ton of sense and it like helps you appreciate what is you know what is happening there and so yeah i, I would say piece of advice is don't just take a piece or a project at face value you actually get to understand you know what you're seeing and you know what actually went into making it definitely yeah and i think also just getting to know the artist because like you said maybe they have a backstory behind a project that you don't know of and that it'll help you understand you know, what this project is all about. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Well, uh, Proper, how can people reach out to you if they have any, you know, questions? Maybe if you have any, like, social media that you want to mention? Uh, at the moment, uh, so my Twitter is underscore, underscore, Proper. Uh, if you want to find the guy impersonating me, you can go to underscore, 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 Proper, and feel free to report <laughs> him while you're there. Uh <laughs> My, if you want to, you know, check out my gallery, it's gallery.so slash proper. And if you want to also see my foundation it, with the uh, Josh's piece that I was mentioning, along with some other, you know, great gen artists, one of ones, uh, it's foundation.app slash proper. Awesome. And then if you don't mind, actually, maybe you, once we're done with our conversation in a second, if you mind dropping the links inside of the Artblocksman's chat, that way, you know, someone can, can check those out. Oh, it looks like. D Bachman is already on it. So <laughs> looks like you're covered. <laughs> Thanks, D Bach. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Proper, for being on, talking to us about your story, how you got into, you know, crypto, NFTs, and uh, and also art blocks. And we really appreciate what you've done on the platform. And I'm sure I'll see you on Block Talk. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Cool. And with that being said, uh, we're gonna go ahead and transition over to the squiggle giveaway. Uh, I will post a link shortly that will lead you to four trivia questions. Most answers can be found on the community-driven Artblocks wiki page, which is artblocks.wiki. I'll drop the link in a couple times. Oh, whoops. That's too many times. Hold on a second. There we go. <laughs> cool. We'll go in. Uh, so... For the trivia, anyone who hasn't been on here before, you'll need to answer all four questions correctly. And for those who get all answers correct within three minutes, their names will be put into a number random number generator, and one person will be the winner of a brand new squiggle. So we'll go ahead and get that counter started. We got about 160 seconds left. And during that time, I'm gonna just briefly talk about um, some love, it, love to see it highlights of the week. We just have the one for today. Uh, community member Wuda reached out randomly to D. Bachman, never having spoken to him in DMs before. Not only was he super kind, but he took the time to help me make sure the offer was reasonable. And he then helped mediate the deal between uh, himself or themselves, I'm sorry, uh, and VVD. Wuda offered to compensate D. Bachman for their work, and D. Bachman refused. Uh, it was a tough decision for Wuda. Um, you know, it created a lot of stress, and D. Bachman was super kind and thoughtful and helped them out and just, you know, took time out of their day to uh, help guide them in the right direction. So, shout out to D. Bachman. Thank you so much for um, providing that little tidbit, uh, Wuda, appreciate you. For anyone that has a love to see it highlight of the week, please drop me a DM so we can share some positive highlights from the community. Um, with that, we have about 90 seconds left. And yeah, maybe Snowfro, do you have any uh, news and, and comments you want to kind of bring up before we get the squiggle going? Man, I really enjoyed uh, both uh, 
the interviews today. Thank you guys so much for coming on and uh, sharing your story. Um, Josh, the stuff you have coming up is looking pretty awesome, dude. Pretty edible. So I can't wait to maybe <laughs> meet some of that stuff. Uh, and proper man, thank you for all of the all of the joy that you bring our Discord. It's pretty it's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, I don't have I don't have too much to share. Just one kind of little tidbit because there is, uh, you know, there's some questions um, about Doodle Labs, and uh, you know, we're pretty excited about this. This is a you know, one of, one of the thoughts I thought early on uh, in the generative art world was that, like, we weren't going to be the only ones that were going to be able to have success and ideas and projects in the generative art space. And, you know, we think that there's going to be some opportunities down the road for commercial and enterprise and stuff that maybe doesn't fit directly on art blocks, like is art, artist driven. Although I would have to say that the Doodle Labs project is artist driven and it's pretty awesome. Uh, they might... They might bring on some corporate stuff and uh, we we want there to be a home for all these things and so we are uh, essentially hosting rendering and minting and uh, they're using a licensed version of our smart contract uh, to create their own platform like our blocks and so we're excited to see it it's a total experiment guinea pig they're very brave to allow us to to host their stuff but uh friday i think we're going to see their first drop and uh, while it has nothing to do specifically with our blocks in terms of the art on our platform and like they're not our artists, they are very actively working with us to like make their, their drop be a success and we're working with their artists and uh, it's been a really pleasant experience, a, a little uh, uh, down to the wire, but we're getting there. So uh, yeah, enjoy Friday's drop of uh, Family Mooks. <laughs> Should be fun. Cool. Um, but yeah, no, besides that, I, I don't really have much to report. Okay, great. It looks Go like... Go Astros. Go Astros. Or <laughs> actually, I don't know who else is playing, but I'm cool with Astros. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll just hold my... I'll, I won't say anything about the Astros. <laughs> um, all right, so we got... It uh, looks like we have all the entries in. We have 160 total that were right. entered in today. Good luck to everyone. Luke, if you don't mind, go ahead and fire up the... The squiggle bot. And remember to have your address ready. Yes. Please We're going to have, have a your... competition to see who can get me their address the fastest. Maybe you get like a automatic hyper or something, you know? Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, just a big high five. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Number 72. What is it? Okay. Uh, Lou's going to drop the, the name in Discord. Starts with the letter H. That's all I know. <laughs> oh, H. Benny, number 0699. Here, I'll go tag them. H. Uh, I don't know if I see them on H. Benny. Oh, there you go. Your, congratulations to H. Benny. Yay, H. Benny. Please drop your... ETH address to Snowfro. Oh, there we go. Bachman found him. That guy you? Oh, there he is. All right. Hey, there you are. Now send me your ETH address, dude. Or do that. Yeah. Let us know. Uh... Well, while we uh, wait on that, uh, on next week's show, I'm really, really excited. So that's Wednesday, October 27th at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we have a special guest, Kevin Rose, on After Dinner Mints. Super, super excited to have Kevin on the show. And yeah, that'll be the only guest next week. Uh, I'm already lined up a couple other ones for November and really, really excited to kind of announce those, you know, as I get those all confirmed. But you'll see in the upcoming projects, there's a pinned message in there. I will basically update that one post with, you know, any of the guests, uh, any of the links for the live streams, uh, all that inside the upcoming projects channel. All right. So I got the address. You did? Okay. Great. Yep. Let me get this thing going. And then for the squigglers... If you could please stand by on a multi-sig to uh, 
to mint this puppy. One second, let me find it again. All right, purchase two, OXAE, add transaction. All right, cool. If you, oh wait, hold on one second, one second, one second. If you guys are out there, You know, Gnosis is doing this weird thing again where it just sits there and says estimating. I think I think some other folks were having issues with this today, but uh, it's taking a little while. Stand by. No problem at all. It says transaction likely to fail, but it's a signature. Why would that fail? Okay. <laughs> um, Cool. Squigglers, if you can see that, please uh, sign it. Oh, it's not appearing. Oh, there it is. Yeah, cool. All right, I see two of you all. We just need one more. Come on, Gnosis. Don't be weird. Oh man, I wonder if you guys are having a hard time like we, like I was having a hard time. You think it's something we'll have to, to wait on or? Well, Gnosis is being kind of, oh, there we go. Execute. Oh, sweet. It still says it's gonna fail. Man, I don't like it when it acts this way. It's just kind of kind of weird. Okay, estimated gas fee. Oh yeah, that would definitely fail. Uh, let's try 500,000 gas. Um, we'll, we'll show you in a second, Josh, but Josh has uh, the gecko in his hand. What? Whoa. Uh, well, the transaction is sent, so now we just gotta wait for it to to execute. Let's see that gecko, dude. Did it go through or are we still? Uh, it's pending. I sped it up too, oh, okay. so it, it should go kind of quicker. Uh, uh, Jay Fells, you want to know about these prints? This print right there is uh, Herbert Frank. It's a screen print. I think it's from 1971 wow. as well. And then back there I have uh, the bright numbers in motion uh, rainbow piece, which is I think one of my favorite. Our blocks pieces of all time. And then um, Chettle, uh, a couple years ago, or maybe last year, had a piece at Kate Voss Gallery that is basically the cubes from the archetype set. Oh, wow. Um, that he he made and had printed, uh, and I bought it uh, last year. And then we have a couple Jeff Davises over here. Sorry for the box. Uh, those aren't NFTs. Uh, those are just his prints from, I think, just from back in the day. Uh, what else do we have around here? I have a lot of good stuff around here I'm pretty excited about. Uh, a couple more shuttles. Wow. My buddy Carlos and uh, Heath West is a local artist. When does the Snowfro exhibit space open up? <laughs> yeah, no. Maybe, maybe one day. <laughs> this is actually one of my first pieces of art. I made that piece. Oh, wow. My baby. Is that a That's physical where... or those like 3D? Yeah, they were 3D printed. If you oh, look real awesome. closely, yeah, yeah, I could see them now. Printed. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm walking around my <laughs> house with my computer, and my wife is laughing at me. 
and the transaction went through, so we should see squiggles soon. Oh wow, is that is that it, Luke? Or a squiggle soon? It's a it's a fuzzy. All right, fuzzy. Ooh, that's a really nice fuzzy too. Let me see it. Let me see it. Let me see it. Yay! Oh man, yeah, lots of color there. That's super nice. Sweet. Congrats. Congrats. H Benny. Woo. Cool. Well, thank you, Snowfur, for doing that for the Squiggle giveaway. It's always much yeah, appreciated. Course. I know people in the community pleasure. always look forward to it. Uh, well, I want to thank my uh, all of our guests today, uh, Snowfro, Josh Bagley, and Proper for joining me on After Dinner Mints. Uh, it's always a pleasure having these really cool guests on. And yeah, I just feel honored to be able to talk to you know people from the community, artists. And yeah, there's Josh with... Uh, what was the name of the the gecko? I think you're muted. There we go. This oh, is, there this you is go. Kyra. Oh, she's freaking out now. Oh, no. <laughs> there she is. Oh, oh my gosh, that's awesome. It looks that's like so cool. Pieces. She is she's 13, so wow. she's been around for quite wow. a bit. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Well, thank yeah. you for, for showing her. That's awesome. <laughs> Oh, yeah. well, well, thank you to all three of our guests again for, for being on. It's always a pleasure speaking to, you know, people of the community, artists, and, you know, also with Snowfro. Uh, as always, make sure you comment, like, and subscribe to the Artblocks YouTube channel. Be kind to each other. Buy what you love. Set up a hardware wallet, and we will see you uh, all next week. Hell yeah. All right, everybody. Bye, thank take you. care. See you all. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.